on today's episode of the Cryptoverse. I would like to do a deep dive into the state of the ICO market. And I would like to share some insights that have led me to believe that we have this paradigm completely wrong. And I'd also like to recommend some ways we can correct it. So many of us have lost money in ICOs. I certainly have. And I want to explain exactly why that has happened and how we can stop it from happening again. This is truly a deep dive video, so this is the only topic I'm going to be talking about today. And therefore, I strongly advise you to eliminate distractions before absorbing this info. I've put a lot of effort into this video with the explicit intention of saving you from future financial loss. So do yourself a favor and concentrate on it. I'd ordinarily say fine, have me on in the background, but this one's a deep dive, so I think it deserves your full attention. Now, I originally entitled this episode two reasons to pledge to ICOs and one big reason not to. And pretty much all of what I'm going to say here is coming from me, my own observations and insights. So let me start by giving you these three reasons. So if that's all you've come for, you can get them and bounce out. And then if you want the deep dive, you can stick around. So here we go. The two reasons, the only two reasons to pledge to an ICO are number one, because you want the project to see the light of day. And two, because you actually want to use the product yourself and are willing to pay up front for them to build it. The one big reason not to invest in an ICO is to make a financial return on investment. And this is the major distinction that I draw between IPOs and ICOs. The two are often compared, but I'm really starting to think that's a flawed comparison. I mean, people often say that the names are the same, right? IPO, ICO sounds the same, initial coin offering, initial public offering. And that's, I suppose, logically, you think they, they're the same because of that. Where it's, it's a flawed comparison because IPOs are most definitely within the realm of investing money with the expectation of a financial return. That's why they are considered securities and that's why they are the realm of the regulators. The reason it's a flawed comparison is because ICOs were not born out of the IPO market. ICOs were born out of the crowdfunding market. And when we look at it from that point of view, we can see why it's just not logical that we can expect a financial return on investment from a crowdfunding campaign. So let's take that point further. For a moment, let's take crypto out of the equation and go back to how crowdfunding worked before ICOs came along. I've picked out a small Kickstarter project which has been fully funded to help me illustrate this. So let me hop over here. This is a very small project with a fundraising goal of like 777 British pounds, but it'll, it'll help me demonstrate the point perfectly well. Now, the first thing to highlight here is the language. You're referred to on Kickstarter as a backer, a backer, not an investor. So that's the first point to make. The second point to make is that at no point do you ever think you're going to get your money back from the project. Right. This only happens if, say, the project falls short of its fundraising goal, then everyone gets refunded. But once the project is on, it's on. And you don't ever think you're going to get the money back, right? Or return of any financial kind. So the question is, what do you get? What's the incentive to back these projects? And the answer is perks. That's technically what they're called in the crowdfunding lingo. And, langu and language is, is crucially important because that's what carries the meaning. So in this case, on this Kickstarter project, there are perks of increasing value, which unlock based on how much financial support you give to the project. So let's just do a quick run through these perks. So if we scroll down to the support section, we've got the first thing, which is make a pledge without a reward. So let's take that one. That group of people is definitely category one that we mentioned earlier on. People that are willing to donate money because they believe in the project and want it to see the light of day and don't particularly want to consume the project, the project or the product themselves, but they want to back it so it sees the light of day. So that's category number one. The other people might want something for their for their money, so that's where we go on. If you pledge $15 or more, you get an ebook. If you do, pledge $20 or more, you get early access to the ebook, and then it goes up to $25 if you want a physical copy of the book. $30 if you want early access to the physical copy, then it goes on to audiobook, early access to the audiobook, um, physical copy, then it goes on to signed copies, 
as the price goes up and so on, right? And they sort of introduced scarcity here by having only a certain number of perks at each level, which encourages people to, you know, pledge more backing uh, at the higher levels first before it runs down from there. But notice something crucially important here. What you get for your money is the product being proposed, and that's it. Thus, it should only appeal to those two groups of people that we mentioned at the start. One, people who believe in the project and want it to see the light of day, and two, people who want the product themselves and are willing to pay up front so that it can be created. The other key element of crowdfunding that I think is talked about way less often than it should be is the benefit to the founders of the project. So the key, or rather the success or failure of a crowdfunding campaign is in my opinion, the highest quality form of market research. Right, the success or failure of a crowdfund, it tells the project founder a lot about whether there is demand for the proposed product before they create it. And that's the holy grail of business because compare that to the old wasteful model where before crowdfunding, you'd spend all your money developing the product, prototyping it, manufacturing it, getting it in stores or you know, spending loads of money marketing it. And only then would you find out there wasn't a market for it. And by then, too late. You lose all that money, all that time, all that energy. So crowdfunding, especially thanks to the internet, so crowdfunding online means even a very niche product can find a small market, a small group of people that will be willing to provide the money to create it in exchange for the creation itself. So that market research element is one of the elements that has become grossly distorted in the ICO market. So if I said that explicitly, I would say that the success of an ICO's fundraising campaign has absolutely no bearing on how much demand there is for the product they're building. And this is where ICOs end up residing. They're not crowdfunding campaigns and neither are they IPOs, right? What the, the ICO innovation, it was a good one, and it could have gone one of two ways. It could have combined the best of both worlds. It could have been the best of IPOs and the best of crowdfunding and created massive innovation and abundance. Or it could have gone the other way and ended up in this no man's land between the two. Now, I might change my opinion on this at a later date when I gain more knowledge and experience, which is generally the way it goes. But as I speak to you now, I believe ICOs have ended up in that no man's land where it's not the best of both worlds, it's the worst of both. So here's another question. Do we honestly believe that ICOs would have been successful in raising money in 2017 if they stayed true to the crowdfunding model? Let me say that another way. Do we honestly believe that if ICOs acted like Kickstarter campaigns and appealed exclusively, exclusively to people who wanted to see the product made and two people who genuinely wanted to use the product themselves if icos only took money from those two groups do we honestly think any of them would have hit their fundraising targets one or two of them might have done but 99 percent of them just wouldn't and the one or two that did make it would have been the very very best of the bunch the very best ideas the one with ones with true market demand and in that scenario, the whole ICO concept would have acted like a filtering mechanism where the crowd vote with their money what's a good idea and what's not a good idea. And I'll say that again. The reason this system broke down was because the vast majority of the money coming into ICOs during 2017 was coming from the IPO investor mindset, which we now know is a huge mistake. So having said all that, where do we go from here? Well, with the experience I now have and the awareness I've now come to over this last year, there's only one way we can go, and that's backwards. We have to go back to the original crowdfunding paradigm where we only ever back projects and we never invest in them. I mean, the ICOs themselves bear a lot of responsibility here because they were the ones referring to us on their websites as investors. They're also the ones allocating tokens to themselves, and they're also the ones getting them listed on exchanges. So here's another big question. Why would an ICO ever retain tokens for themselves. Under the old crowdfunding paradigm, there's only one legitimate reason why they would do that, which is that they want the tokens to pay for their own usage of the product. 
And that's where the perks come in for an ICO, right? The main perk of participating in an ICO and getting the tokens is to pay for your usage of the project or the product. And that's the true description of a utility token. And we actually, we see a trend here, don't we, with ICOs. We see them increasingly wanting to brand their token as a utility token to sort of sidestep the regulations, but at the same time, retaining a large number of tokens for themselves and making sure they get them listed on exchanges so that those tokens acquire value. Now, unfortunately, they have to be listed on the exchanges because otherwise, people who didn't back the project in the crowdfund can't get the tokens and pay for their usage of the system. The question is though, do tokens absolutely have to be listed on exchanges? Couldn't the ICO project founders issue tokens to their backers, as they promised in the perks, and couldn't the projects have a way of taking payment on their website and then issuing tokens to people who didn't participate in the crowdfund? Because if someone else wants to use the project or the product that didn't participate in the ICO, they need a way to buy the tokens. Could they do that directly from the founders' websites? If we did that, we might cry centralization, but not if the tokens were exclusively controlled by a smart contract, which takes in the payment in form of, say, EOS or Ethereum, and then issues the to token automatically to the buyers autonomously, right? And I'm talking about after the crowdfund is over. So you send Ethereum or EOS to the relevant smart contract, it sends you the tokens back, you spend the tokens to make use of the project, the product, or the service. Those tokens go back to the control of the smart contract, and the smart contract then sells them on to new users who want to use the, the project. And that's the closed loop ecosystem. So if you ask, well, what would the smart contract do with those funds? Well, they would transfer it to the developers, right? So the developers could continue to develop the product, but without the developers or the founders being able to corrupt the token economics. The smart contract has the closed loop system where it autonomously issues tokens to people that buy them, transfers the proceeds to the developers, and then reissues the tokens and takes them back on when people spend them. So that all sounds good, right? But there's nothing stopping anyone listing the tokens on a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, say, and then trading them that way. Now, while we can't stop that from happening, we wouldn't be actively encouraging the speculation. On top of that, if we go back to the Kickstarter example, buying tokens in an ICO and then selling them on an exchange would be the equivalent of going to Kickstarter, buying like this physical signed copy of the book or even just a regular physical copy of the book, and then someone like flipping it on the secondary market, like selling a secondhand book on eBay, which again would only be purchased by someone who wanted to use the product for themselves, right? And this is most likely why ICO coins fall so far they fall to their fundamental value. In the case of the book, they fall to their retail value or lower than the retail value because if you're willing to pay the retail value, you might as well buy a new one directly from the retailer, right? From the founders or the manufacturers. So if you go to the secondary market like eBay, you expect to pay less than the price of a new book, right? So same goes for ICO tokens. And the very fact that many ICO tokens have fallen through the floor in price is proof that the vast majority of money that was raised during crowdfunds during 2017 was from that third group. People who mistakenly invest in, invested in them for a financial return thinking they were like IPOs. So this is now my position on ICOs. I think they're an excellent tool, but they're only an evolution of crowdfunding. My ICOs are blockchain, and cryptocurrency technology applied to crowdfunding. They are not a new financial instrument. So this is now the lens I'm gonna view ICOs through. And it's also now my standing advice when I'm giving people advice about ICOs. So let me summarize that advice. You should only ever send money to an ICO when one of two of these criteria are satisfied. Number one, you passionately believe that the project will be of great benefit to the world and are willing to donate your money to it so that it sees the light of day. And two, you personally want to use the product being proposed and are willing to help fund its development in exchange for the use of the product at a later date. If you pledge money to an ICO for any other reason, you have a 98.8% statistical probability of losing it all. And those figures are based on ICO research conducted by this organization called Blockbeats, 
and I'll link to their research in the show notes if you want to dig into it. So let's stop using language like investing in a project and let's go back to describing it as backing a project and everyone will be better off as a result. And that's all I've got for you today. So if you like this episode, go ahead and hit that like button. If you disliked it, hit the dislike button. Please leave me a comment below with some feedback and get subscribed. And if you would like access to my very best material, such as my structured online courses, check out my website. It's cryptoversity.com. If you click on courses, you can either learn how blockchain technology works under the hood, take the Digital Money Revolution course. If you want to learn 21 fast track ways to make and save money with Bitcoin, take the Secrets of the Bitcoin Triangle course. And if you want to learn how to make money trading cryptocurrencies, take the Master Cryptocurrency Trader course. If you want to follow me on the social networks, go to the podcast page on the website and all the social networks are listed on there. Other than that, I will be back with the next episode of the Cryptoverse. So until then, it's me, Chris Coney, saying bye for now.